Hi, this is a um, PowerPoint video about uh, Unit 2, which includes famous economists. We're going to look at about nine of them, and our key questions are, who are they, why are they famous, and why are they important? First, Xenophon. Xenophon is considered the first economist. Was he the first person to ever deal with scarcity? Yes or no? But he gets credit as the first person to write about people's struggles with scarcity, which again is the fact that our resources are limited and not enough to meet our needs usually. Here's a statue of Xenophon. He lived about 400 BC in ancient Greece, and he wrote a book called Oikonomikos. In Greek, oiko means household and nomikos means management. So the title oikonomikos means household management. What does household management have to do with economics? Well, like a national economy or a state economy, households have needs. Someone has to earn money, get food, cook it, do the dishes, take out the trash. And households also have resources. They can use, like people with their labor and skills, to satisfy those needs and get those needs accomplished. Households, like economies, like economies, have to decide who gets what, who gets the car on Friday night, who gets the big bedroom. In his book, Xenophon wrote, you should not waste time, your household should be neat and organized, like this one, and household members should specialize at what they do best. He said women should cook and clean, and men should manage the business and the workers, uh, what would we today think of organizing work based just on gender? Would we think that's a good idea? Yes or no? Why or why not? So why is Xenophon important? Again, he's the first of our nine important famous economists. Second, Adam Smith. Here he is. In the 1700s, Adam Smith was a professor in Scotland here at the university. What did he believe and why? And why is he important? He asked some important questions. One, why do strangers cooperate in the marketplace? And his answer is that both sides, both the buyer and the seller, act only out of selfish self-interest. But because each side has what the other side wants, one side has money, one side has a product, their selfishness ends up, guided by an invisible hand, helping everybody. The market makes selfishness help everyone. So Adam Smith is the father of EP8, Markets Are Great. And he wrote this famous line, it is not from the benevolence or kindness of the butcher, the brewer, or the baker that we expect our dinner, but from their regard to their own interest. We address ourselves not to their humanity, not to their kindness, but to their self-love. So what does that quote mean? Is Adam Smith saying that greed is good? Somewhat. It motivates people to work and to take care of themselves. But if you, a company, take advantage of, say, a poor little old lady just to get, say, three more cents, Adam Smith said, that's wrong. You'll get a bad reputation. And how will that bad reputation affect your business? Can the market do everything? Adam Smith says it's so great. Can the market do everything? Yes or no? Smith said, Smith said we need a government. We need a government for law and order. So the government should run the, and he said the government should provide defense. So the government should run the, and he wanted the government to provide public goods in terms of transportation. So the government should provide, and in education, he wanted the government to provide, and he wanted the government to provide welfare programs to help the poor. He said society is fair only if the poor workers who make our food, clothes, and homes also get enough food, clothes, and homes so that they can too can survive. After all, they're providing for us, 
they should be able to get enough to survive. He also believed the government needs to tax the people and tax the rich more than they tax the poor to pay for the services above. In general, he believed the government should let the markets obey the laws of supply and demand. He wanted politicians to get out of the way. They should be hands off. In French, it's called laissez-faire, let it be, let the market be. So there should be no tariffs, no politicians interfering. So would Adam Smith be considered today a liberal Democrat or a conservative Republican, or maybe a little bit of both? And why? Adam Smith also asked, why are some nations rich and others poor? He answered that question in his most important book, The Wealth of Nations, which was published in 1776, when Thomas Jefferson wrote the uh, Declaration of Independence. Adam Smith wrote that the wealth of nations is determined by how much people specialize. If people specialize in just one task, then they will become experts at it and then work faster and better, producing even more stuff in less time. We'll have more tomatoes, more tables, and t-shirts. People will have more stuff to sell. They'll be able to get more money by selling their tomatoes, tables, and t-shirts, and they'll have more money, then they can buy more things. Everyone's better off. So Adam Smith wanted the division of labor, and he wanted jobs to be divided up so people could specialize on one task. And you see that here with this old assembly line and the current assembly line. Adam Smith gave the famous example of a pin factory. You know, like a pin, like you use to, to sew. A pin maker, Smith pointed out, could not produce 20 pins in a day if he himself had to do everything required. If he had to draw out the wire, straighten it, cut it, point it, grind it, put the head on it, make the head, and so on. Yet Smith observed that 10 people with the proper division of labor among them, in other words, dividing up the job of making a pin into 18 different steps, were able to make 48,000 pins in a day. So look at that increase in productivity. One person by himself doing all the steps would make 20 pins in a day, but if you break it up into 18 different steps and each person specializes, then uh, you could make, uh, 10 people could make 48,000 pins in a day or 4,800 pins per person. That's a big increase on 20. So I'll ask you, why is Adam Smith important? The third economist was Thomas Malthus. He was English. He lived around 1760 to 1830. And Malthus said, you poor factory workers are having too many kids. And you know kids are expensive. They're, they eat up your savings. You workers are making yourself poor by having all these kids. You're falling into what we now call the Malthusian trap. You're having these kids. They're eating up your savings and your money. What were his solutions? Lower the population through war, famine, <laughs> disease, not very fun solutions, and birth control. He said the government should not give the poor welfare, do not give the poor help. If you give the poor money, they will just have more kids. Why is he important? Before Malthus, European Christians believed God has provided us with so many natural resources. We have plenty. Let's use it all. Let's use what God gave us and get rich. After Malthus, people realized, wait a second, we might run out of resources. Let's not consume or use too much. So what do you think Malthus would think of today's efforts to reduce, reuse, and recycle? Do you think he'd like that? The next economist is David Ricardo. He was English, lived about 1770 to 1820, and he gets credit for four big achievements. First of all, it is he who came up with the theory of comparative advantage. He said countries should do what they're best at. What are they best at? Whatever task, whatever activity gives them the lowest opportunity cost. For example, second, 
His arguments in favor of free trade convinced the British government to stop putting tariffs on imported food coming into Britain. That helped Britain focus on making blank. And it helped poor British workers because the price of food went up or down once the tariffs were removed. He also gets credit for explaining the law of diminishing returns, which says, and he read his friend Malthus's writing and Ricardo came up with the iron law of wages, which says, you poor workers are having too many kids. Your kids grow up to be workers, so the supply of workers will go up or go down. So then if there are a lot of workers, worker pay will go up or go down. So he said, workers will always be poorly paid. That's the iron law of wages. You guys are having too many workers. You're increasing the supply of labor too much. So pay goes down. You workers are keeping yourself poor. So why was Ricardo important? The next important economist was Karl Marx, a German who lived from 1820 to 1880. He's famous because he's the father of communism. And we'll talk more about him in more detail. The next important economist is John Maynard Keynes. He was English and he lived from 1880 to 1946. Here's Keynes here. He said, let's study the national economy as a whole and look at national issues such as unemployment and inflation. Doing that will help us and the government manage the economy so we can uh, grow and get richer. Thus, Keynes was the father of macroeconomics, that is, looking at the big picture and studying national economies. Keynes lived during the Great Depression from 1929 when the stock market crashed to 1939. He said that when the economy crashes, people lose money, so they spend less. So then stores and companies make less money. So they fire workers since they're not making any money, not selling any product. They fire their workers, then the workers spend less. It's this downward spiral that continues. And the problem is there's not enough consumer demand and the market does not bounce back. And you can see this here in the Great Depression, these unemployed people lining up for free coffee and donuts. To put it in graphical terms, we start here and then the stock market would crash, so demand would go down from D1 to D2. The companies then don't sell as much, so they cut back on supply from S1 to S2. You see the quantity of stuff made is shrinking. It's going down to zero. Because workers get fired, demand shifts down. And since companies aren't selling their product, they're going to lay off workers and cut back on supply. And the economy keeps shrinking here down to zero. Again, it's a downward spiral. What was Keynes's solution? He said that the government should borrow money. After all, the government can't raise taxes during a depression. The government should then give the people jobs and pay them for that work. Then the workers will have money. They will spend it. Then the stores and companies will make more money. They'll be selling products again. Then the stores and companies will hire more people. So the people will have more money. And now you get a helpful cycle. Government gives the people money. People spend. Companies hire. So people have jobs. So people spend. And now it's a helpful spiral. In short, John Maynard Keynes said that when the government, cra when the economy crashes, the government must borrow to spend and provide enough demand. And that's basically what pre uh, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt did. You see him here in the 1930s. If you remember from U.S. history, he made these New Deal jobs programs. They were an example of Keynesian intervention. So here, for example, is an American worker. He was given a job by the U.S. government. If you remember the works, uh, 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 works Program Administration, uh, Works Project Administration, I forget the exact name. And here's his government check. He's now going to spend that at a store, at a company. They'll hire more people. The workers will have money to spend, and the economy will rebound. Again, Keynes says when the economy crashes, it keeps going down. 
Okay, so the government needs to borrow and provide people with money, provide people with demand, and that'll jumpstart the economy and get it growing again. On the other hand, Fred Friedrich Hayek, Hayek was an Austrian, he disagreed. He lived from 1900 to 1990, and he believed that government spending to get out of depressions or politicians spending in order to get votes is going to cause the taxes that pay for government spending to go up or down. And people will keep wanting more government benefits and politicians will keep spending money to get elected. So the taxes to fund all that spending will go up or down. Soon, Hayek predicted, the government will take all your money. So you'll be like a serf, like a slave. And so he wrote a famous book called The Road to Serfdom. And he said, all this government spending that John Maynard Keynes is calling for is going to lead to higher taxes and basically will be like slaves. It'll be like serfdom. So what is the point of this cartoon? I'll give you a hint. Here's some future taxpayers weighed down, burdened by this big government that in 2007, 2008, bailed out these companies, bailed out the Wall Street banks, okay? And here you see these future taxpayers uh, having to pull this big ship through the sandy desert. So what is the point of this cartoon? The next famous economist was Milton Friedman. He was an American and he lived from roughly 1910 to 2005. He was an economics professor at the University of Chicago. He believed the following. First of all, he was very short. Okay, here's Friedman and his wife Rose, and here's uh, Ronald Reagan. Milton Friedman believed in order to be truly free, you need political freedom, you know, democracy where you have elections and vote and you choose the government. And Friedman said, you also need economic freedom. You have to also be able to spend your money and your time as you want. So do you think he wanted taxes to be high or low? Was he for or against the draft for the Vietnam War? He saw the draft as a tax on young men's time. Do you think he was for or against the draft? Was he for or against drug legalization? Do you think he was in favor of a big government or was he in favor uh, uh, of the free market? Back in the 1970s, there was a lot of inflation, a lot of rising prices. He said that the inflation was caused by the government printing too much money to fight the war in Vietnam and to fight the war on poverty. There was too much money out there. Stores saw that, so they were raising prices. So Friedman wanted the government to print and spend less money. Why was he important? Because many conservative Republicans, such as Richard Nixon, who was Republican president from 69 to 74, and Ronald Reagan, who was Republican president from 81 to 89, agreed with Milton Friedman, sort of the intellectual godfather of a lot of conservative Republicans. Two more. Paul Samuelson was another famous economist. He was an American. He lived from 1915 to about, that should say, 2010. And uh, he was an economics professor at MIT. He actually lived in Belmont, just, just up uh, 128. What did Paul Samuelson believe? He said that markets and companies are great at matching supply and demand, as long as you have money. Again, EP8, markets are great. And he said companies are great at making products cheaper and better, right? Apple fighting against Samsung, both making these great cell phones to get our business. Markets are great. Also, he said government is needed to help regulate business and make rules for businesses and to help the poor and to provide non-excludable goods such as roads and bridges for everybody. So he's the father of EP10, which remember says what? Last. Joseph Schumpeter, he was an Austrian economist from 1880 to 1950. He was a Harvard econ professor. And he said the following, once a company makes a lot of money, it'll attract competitors. They want to make a lot of money too. And they'll come in and compete. That competition often kills old companies, but it also creates better products at lower prices. 
He called it creative destruction. So you see one company succeeding, that'll invite competition. The competitors will usually destroy and beat the old company, but they'll create new, better products. In the 1950s, Schumpeter said this, he basically predicted the economy we have today, which is full of startup companies and is very competitive. For example, here's an example of creative destruction. If you remember, we had Blockbuster Video, we had Hollywood Video, you had to get in your car and drive to the store and get the VHS cassette tape. What happened to Blockbuster Video? Eh. And what happened to Netflix? It came in and offered a better product, streaming, you didn't have to go to the store, and so Netflix basically destroyed Blockbuster and created a new, better service. Now you can stream. Here's another example. In the beginning, back in 2005, MySpace was more popular, and then along came Facebook, and Facebook did a better job of uh, creating uh, social media, and people liked it better. So it destroyed MySpace and created a better product. This is a good chart to review. You could get out a piece of paper and fill this in. Here are our nine famous economists, and you can uh, make a chart and fill it in. What do they believe? What are the key terms and vocab and quotations? Why are they important? And why should I care? And we'll talk in a little bit. You can't understand the U.S. government's response to COVID without understanding John Maynard Keynes because they basically followed his advice. I hope this is clear. If you have any questions, please let me know.